Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a special edition of the show. Uh, I've got Craig Collins here, Master Sommelier. Uh, we're post Tech Som. Uh, we've, we've been here. Uh, I've brought my Tech Som. So, you know, I gotta, yeah, I gotta make, make it official. Uh, you know, do you have any idea why, why is enthusiast and connoisseur? Because someone asked me that. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't know what it meant. Someone asked me and said, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. So I'll ask, I'll ask them next year or ask James what, what the difference yeah, is. Yeah, it's probably a good place to start. But uh, we're here at TechSom. We're at post TechSom. Uh, it's been a wonderful conference, as always. Uh, I think, uh, uh, who was it? Was it Drew last night said that? No, who, who someone, when we did the, uh, the best Psalm, someone was talking about how uh, every year it improves, but this year it seems like they really knocked it out of the park. And yeah, you know, this is this was Texom's ninth year. Next year yeah. will be our 10-year anniversary, which is pretty amazing. I'll be here. <laughs> <laughs> As will I. Um, and it, it's amazing to, I've been coming for, since year two, and I can remember when it was in one little small conference room, and right. now we have four rooms, and uh, this year marked, I think, 2,500 attendees over 200 uh, sommeliers competing in the Texas Best Sommelier competition. Right. And we had some 30 master sommeliers and five masters of wine here this year, so it, it's really amazing. Uh, something else I always like to mention is that when Texom started nine years ago, when Drew and James found Texom, there was only one master sommelier in the state of Texas. There are only three advanced candidates right. in the state of Texas, and now, um, and I believe it's because of the work that they have put into this. Um, now we're looking at something that were seven master sommeliers in Texas and some 25 plus advanced candidates. Right. God knows how many certified and intros. And it's, right, yeah. it's amazing what uh, this conference has done for the Texas wine industry. It's, you know, I, this is my fourth year. Um, and I started, I got here because I took my intro and uh, I had a, uh, I signed for the intro, and then somewhere along the line, I realized that there was a conference right after the intro, and I thought, well, that'd be kind of a cool idea to go to this conference. Check if that's that what, out. Yeah, if this is what I'm looking to do at some point, um, instead of being just a regular restaurant manager, um, and uh, and I fell in love with it. I was like, this is the most awesome conference in the world. Yeah, it's great. It's a wonderful opportunity to bring together professionals to to learn together, to educate each other, and to walk away with just kind of that. I'm really excited about what I do yeah. type of a attitude. Yeah, I, I can tell you that this it makes me excited every time I leave here. I mean, well, one, I get excited right before the conference because I'm like, all I can think about is going to this awesome conference. And then when I get when I get done with the conference, I just, all I think about is like, this is, this is why I, I do what I do and, and as far as in the restaurant side of things and why I pursue the wine and all that is because this is such an awesome product. and. And the conference really helps with learning about stuff, and that's that's really what it is. It's, it's a learning thing, you know. Um, we we really uh, it's it's been awesome. But before we go any farther, because that was a that was a segue into something, but I can't. <laughs> we need to know who you are. So uh, let's tell everyone a little bit about yourself, how you got started uh, in the industry, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, my name is Craig Collins. I am a master sommelier. Um, I got started in this industry actually the day that I turned 21. Um, I was a student at Texas A&M University. Had been there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, Mom and Dad kind of said, "You know what? You're no longer you no longer have <laughs> access to our bank account." Um, and I I actually needed a job. Right. Um, so I went to a local winery, Messina Hoff Winery, um, and I applied for a job at the tasting room. And I, I'll never forget uh, Paul Bonarigo, the owner winemaker. He looked at me and said, "You're really young. Do you enjoy wine?" And I said, "No, I've never had wine." 
And he said, well, why are you here? And I said, I think this would be a really good way to meet women. Nice. And he, he loved my honesty. Right. And I got the job. I fell in love with wine there. Um, started working in the tasting room, started managing uh, the tasting room. I had some responsibilities with Harvest. Mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up going over to Italy as a study abroad program uh, with a really great friend of mine. Um, and we, in the wine industry, we talk about those aha moments, that kind of moment where you're just taken back. And for me, it's the goosebumps on the arms and it's like, wow, this is it. Uh, and I had that moment when I was in Tuscany. It was a bottle of 1998 Broncaia, mm -hmm. beautiful little super Tuscan Sangiovese Merlot blend. Um, and I, I came back from that trip in Italy, and I just knew that this is what I'd be doing for the rest right. of my life. Right. It wasn't just a job after college. Yeah. It was, this is it, one of your career, It right? was my career, and I, I'll, I'll never forget going to tell mom and dad, like, like, hey, you're graduating. Like, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> uh, and I told him, I was like, I, I really think I'm going to take a stab at this wine industry thing. And my mom looked at me and she said, you have traveled the world and you have screwed around long enough. It is now time for you to get a real job. Uh, thankfully, dad gave me the blessing and I went on and I started working in the distributor network. Um, started in Houston with a large distributor called Glazers and... Mm -hmm moved to Austin to manage a smaller boutique um, distributor called Prestige Wine Cellars and just kind of went from there. Right. Uh, and you're going to be uh, going with, uh, you're going to be uh, uh, working with a restaurant group in Austin. I am. Right? Um, so my, my most recent job was I was importing Italian wines into the United States mm -hmm. uh, through a company called Dolaterra Imports. Okay. Uh, my last day is Thursday with them. Uh, and then Friday, I start a new chapter of my career. Um, the individual that I mentioned that I lived in Italy with, a good friend of mine, uh, is actually the chef owner of a restaurant group in Austin. Okay. We've been dreaming of doing food and wine together for a long time. And so I've accepted the role of beverage director for the Elm Restaurant Group, okay. uh, which is located in Austin. And it's 24 Diner, Easy Tiger, and we just opened Aero Restaurant. Okay, awesome. Uh, so what, what are those restaurants going to, what, what is each of those restaurants, I guess, menu or, or their theme? So the first concept was 24 Diner, mm -hmm. um, and 24 Diner is kind of what it says. It's a diner that's open 24 hours a day. It's a chef-inspired cuisine. Okay. Um, so it's kind of an elevated diner, uh, classic diner dishes, but kind of more, a little bit elevated, a little more thought put into them. Okay. Um, I'm changing that wine program to be 100% American wine list to kind of reflect the American diner. Right, it makes total sense. Feel, All right. <laughs> um, the second concept that we have is known as Easy Tiger. Easy Tiger is a German beer garden. Uh, wonderful handles on draft, um, killer pretzels, and then upstairs we have a commercial bakery. Okay. So we're supplying some most of the best restaurants in town with bread. Oh, awesome. Um, our newest concept, which opened just a couple of weeks ago, is called Arrow, mm -hmm. uh, located right on 6th Street, and it's a French bistro, 100% um, French wine list, um, chef kicking out just beautiful French dishes, heavy focus on cheese as well as dessert, okay. and a wonderful pastry chef that allows me to actually have a cordial cart and do some really fun uh, right. cordial pairings and dessert wine pairings with their classic desserts. I, I gotta go visit all these now. <laughs> I'm only just down the road, but I never seem to find the time to go up to Austin. It's, well, it's only I, an hour away. It's, it's only not an hour. Like, it's, it's not, not, it's not, not like, far. And I, where I live, it really is really about an hour. Yeah. I mean, I live on the eastern side of town. I don't live on the northwest or west side of town, which adds like another half hour, 45 minutes just for the trip. So um, it's not that far. Well, to give you a little <laughs> bit more motivation, uh, we recently, as of Friday, I had hired Scott Oda. Right. Um, to manage. Texas Best Sommelier. Texas Best Sommelier <laughs> announced last night. So uh, his actual first day is today at 2 o'clock. Oh, nice. So, <laughs> so you think he's going to make it? <laughs> I hope so. We, we had a long talk in the pool last night at about 3. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, I, I can tell you, um, it was about 1 in the morning, and everyone, well, everyone, a lot of people were had already shifted to the pool. Yeah. And I, I went to bring up my stash of things to the to the room and I came back downstairs I went to the pool and I was kind of like 
you know, I'm going to be smart and I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> and, and, and actually, I, I hadn't, it's kind of funny because I stayed on property the whole time. And, um, and it, it, part of that was so if I really want to indulge, I can. And I think the only night that I felt like I even kind of indulged was Saturday night, my first night here, because Sunday and Monday I was just kind of like, do, do, do. and you know, as the night went on, I was like, I'm sober. Yeah, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> but uh, and nobody was nobody was like falling down. I mean, but everyone was having a good time. Um, but you could tell that people had been had finally started indulging rather than you know tasting and spitting, uh, you know, which think, is what we have to do during these conferences. I think part of it is the fact that everyone kind of brings what I call the A-game when, yeah. they, when they come to Texom. And I know that I brought a case and a half of stuff from my cellar. And right. it's it's wine is mint. It is a beverage that is best enjoyed when it's shared. Absolutely. And so when you're staring at a 1978 Rioja, it's like... <laughs> It's going to be really hard for me to spit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 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 uh, even even during the conference, I mean, there there are certain wines during during the during the sessions, or when you go to the hospitality suites, um, or or during the tasting breaks. You know, when you sit and you get to that wine, you're like, I'm not spitting this one. You yeah. know, and if you're not going to have. I mean, it's not like I had, of the eight glasses in front of you at the session. I'm gonna drink all of them. And if and if you did one session that way, it's not like you're going to get drunk, but you know, as professionals, we want to try to make sure our, our palates are good, our senses are still good. But um, yeah, even at the hospitality suites, because I, I have a tendency to do do this when I go to a tasting, whether it's hospitality or the grand tasting, is I try to taste as much as I can. Sure, because um, that's the best I'm, way to learn. Because I'm there to, to to taste everything if I can, and like at the grand tasting is impossible to taste everything. Um, even for for me, totally impossible because my palate would be destroyed. Even if I had all the time in the world to taste the forty tables of wine, so it was probably a hundred something wines out there. But you know, I, I'm I do it and I spit and I do it and I spit. And in our situation, nobody questions that. But I've gone to some of the wine tastings in in, in San Antonio, and I've tasted a wine. The person, some volunteer, they don't really know anything about the wine, and they're like, "This is an awesome wine." They give me the talking points that someone gave them. And I taste it, and, and they go, did you not like it? I said, no, actually, it was wonderful, but <laughs> I have a whole bunch of other wines to taste here. I don't have time to, you know, I don't have, the, I'm not going to risk doing that, but. Yeah, the professional analysis of wine is, um, it is, you have to spit. Yeah. Uh, you, there's no way that an individual would be able to appreciate and enjoy all of Texom by. Yeah. <laughs> Overindulging, and it, it's something that I think a lot of kind of the first timers that come to Texas they get overwhelmed that first night, and they're yeah. like, "Oh my God, this is amazing!" They get all this awesome wine, you know, and uh, <laughs> they they really miss out in the first couple of sessions that next morning. Um, yes, which is really when a lot of it's what Texom's about. It's about it's about having fun. It's about the networking. It's about the camaraderie. But the educational side that is Texom is really what I think makes this such a unique conference and makes us all want to keep coming back. Yeah, it, it, that's, and that really is, it's an educational thing. And, um, and, and you're right, like that, that Monday morning uh, sessions, there's, every year I've heard someone, the person that like kind of introduces everything, makes the comment, oh, it looks like a lot of people had fun at the pool last night. <laughs> you know, every year I've heard them say that in whatever room I've been in. Right. So, um, but yeah, it's it's an awesome conference. So let's talk about your session now. You did a session on Aetna. Yeah. And when uh, when I was looking at the sessions to uh, to pick, um, and, and knowing that I was going to potentially interview you, I but I definitely want to know what your session you had. But when I saw it, it was Aetna. I was like, I don't know anything really about Aetna itself. I know a little bit about Sicily. You know, I know this Neradavola. <laughs> uh, it's a good start. Yeah, <laughs> Colorado. Uh, yeah, I, Marsala. Yeah, Marsala. Yes, uh, um, I, I've had those, but I'm not. But as far as some Etna wines or Enta, as, as yeah, uh, as Enta. As Enta. <laughs> um, so that that was really intriguing because that's another reason why I come to this conference is to learn things that I'm not going to have exposure to. Sure. So let's well, talk about that. You know, I'll. I'll I mentioned my, my study abroad experience in Italy, and it's mm -hmm. where I fell in love with wine. I love Tuscany specifically. Um, I'm, I'm an Italian freak. I, I really, it's my favorite country in the world. It's my, definitely my favorite wines in the world. It's why I was importing Italian wines for so long. Mm -hmm. um, Italy is also the most difficult country in the world to understand wine-wise. 
there's more grape varieties, there's more wine regions, there's more wine laws than any other country in the world. Um, and it really does take somebody that has a little more knowledge to educate on it. Um, Etna, specifically, at Mount Etna is a volcano, largest volcano in, um, in Europe, happens to be in Sicily. Uh, it's one of the, it's a part in the pun, but it's one of the hottest regions in the yeah, world right now. Right. Um, it's really kind of obscure, but the wines coming out of it are just absolutely phenomenal. Um, I had the fortune to go visit Mount Etna earlier this year. Um, she spoke to me, so to speak. Right, uh, yes. <laughs> kind of exploded while I was there, but I, I really, I just fell in love with the region. I fell in love with the wines, fell in love with the people, and it was just something Drew and James gave me the opportunity to share it here, and right. I was happy to do so. Um, I, what I just find, you know, uh, with with that area, just the the vineyards. You were talking about how the vineyards they've had vineyards there for a long time, but they've been abandoned for you know upwards of a hundred years or right. so. And yeah. So you have people that have come in here, come in there to, I guess, revitalize it, and uh, it is I guess an untapped resource. And Absolutely. you have these vines that are just sitting there. Uh, I guess I guess just kind of just sitting there. Just kind of sitting. Yeah. And you said it's also a national park, right? It is that there are parts of Vetna that are also a national park. Yeah. Right. So the wineries have a little bit of difficulty doing some things. Uh, Anytime you're trying to build or do anything commercially in a national park, there's always going to be a little bit more paperwork, a little more restrictions. And right. it's something that the Aetna DOC is really um, having, I don't want to say a difficult time with, but just having to maneuver around is the new buildings and um, the new trellising even for right. um, for a vineyard. It all has to go through some compliance. And then they also have a special uh, difficulty there with some uh, animals, they right? Do. Um, <laughs> they do. There is a pack of wild horses, black stallions, that roam around the national park, and uh, they have been known to trample vineyards. Um, and they can't put up any type of protective wall uh, preventing them from doing so because it yeah. is that national land. Between the volcano blowing up and horses going around. 45 degrees <laughs> 40, slopes, yeah. 3,000 uh, foot elevation. Yeah. Like it's a pretty gnarly area. And it's why, you know, we always talk about in the wine industry, that a grapevine needs to be stressed um, in order to really give us its its full potential. And this is definitely a stressful area to grow some grapes. Yeah. And, and the wines we had were, were all wonderful. Um, you know, I uh, the Norello, Norello Mascalese. Mascalese. That one I it was helps partic- if you use your hands. Yeah, and that you know, and, and Israeli, you know, when I interviewed him and he had the Brunello tasting, it was like you got to say it like this, Brunello di Montalcino. And I was like, okay, I mean, I'm Italian, but I I grew up in Texas. We don't. We don't talk I, I with use, our hands. I, yeah, I almost <laughs> I almost use a derogatory word for Italians, but uh, but anyway, um, there there are there isn't that culture down here. Sure. Um, and and uh, so I, I was born in Jersey, um, which I'm going back in a month or so. So <laughs> I'm happy to go back to go back to the mother mother state or whatever. But um, the culture isn't doesn't exist pretty much outside of the Northeast and sure. parts of Chicago and you know uh, New Orleans apparently has a huge Italian um, population uh, was a lot of mob at, and at one point down there but you know in San Antonio specifically there's 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 not a large community or sure. or, or there's a community but but we're not like inner we're not like tight right basically and I, we moved down there in the 70s so it was even less right but. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have that passion when I when I use Italian words. So when I do that, I sounds I feel like I'm being silly, you know. Even though I'm not trying to be silly or disrespectful, because I I, I love how it sounds. Yeah. I love how the language absolutely. absolutely sounds, you know. And it's not just a it's not just me being biased. I think the Italian language sounds awesome. Um, you know, no no offense to the French, but you sound like you're mumbling all the time, <laughs> and and the Germans sound like they're they're they've got something stuck in their throat. So, uh, but I do have fun saying the German words. So because uh, uh, they are they are fun to say. Yeah. You know, if you kind of have that, uh, I guess Americanized German accent, but they are fun to say. Uh, once and especially once you understand how German actually is pretty much our base language. It's where most of our words actually really came from, and you start looking at the words, you go, oh. Okay, instead of just like going, oh, there's a bunch of letters there, I don't know what it means, you start, oh, I get it, that's actually the word for <laughs> this in English, okay. 
but uh, yeah, Italy's Italy's awesome. I I, I really enjoy uh, the wines from there. Uh, yeah. Tuscany is definitely a favorite. Um, I hope to eventually go there at some point. You know, I've only made the one trip to Europe. Um, so you know, it's interesting. The wines the wines of Italy are very interesting in the sense that the Italians what they care most about is food. Mm -hmm. um, truly, it's everything in their culture is based around based around the table, based around that dining experience. So. The wines, if we were to be professionally evaluating the wines right now, they would come off as a little bit bitter. Um, the wines aren't meant to be analyzed in a setting where you're not eating something. Yeah. They're meant to uh, pr to enhance a dining experience in the same way that in Texas we use salsa as a right. condiment. They're using wine. The, the acid, the tannin, the structure of an Italian wine is meant to really sing once you have something else going on in your mouth. And right. Um, I think that's something that also makes it Italy a bit difficult to understand. It's, you know, we as so many as professionally evaluate these wines in a very sterile environment. Right. And a lot of times those Italian wines can come off as bitter, but the second you put even a little piece of cheese in your mouth or a cracker, it's yeah. these wines open up and come to life, and it's pretty amazing. And that's something to remember when you're when you're whether you're at home or you're you're a psalm. Uh, when you're evaluating these wines is what can I pair with this wine? It's not just the Italian, not really al almost every wine sure. really kind of needs food. There are some wines you can just totally just sit on the porch or sit yeah. at the table and drink and sip and enjoy. Um, but yeah, think about where what you're going to put with this, with yeah. this food. Um, it's very significant, that food and wine pairing. I always, uh, at the restaurant, I always look at a great dish, a great wine, but I'm not looking for one plus one equals two, I'm looking for one plus one equals three. Right. It's that combination, that marriage of those two to give the guests an elevated experience. I think in the session you even used the phrase, if it grows together, it goes together. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, I've, I've heard it, so I, I subscribe to that, I don't want to bang in my thing. Um, you know, I, I totally subscribe to that theory that, because uh, uh, I've seen it in practice. Sure. That if, if a wine comes from a certain region, that the food that comes from that region, they they were, a, there's a synergy involved. Yeah. You know, the wine is this way because of the food, or the food is this way because of the wine, or they just kind of happen to to work together. Especially when we're talking old world, they've had centuries to figure this stuff out. You know, as Americans, we're still relatively young, especially with wine, um, and trying to figure out what we what goes together, what what our regional wines are going to be and what the food, how it's going to match up, you know, I mean, besides, you know, I mean, as far as bringing it to Texas, you know, the, the, the debate of should we have an international varietal, should we have these other varietals and, and all that, and I'll leave that for another time, but uh, <laughs> because I think in an upcoming show we're going to be talking about some stuff that's Texas specific, but it actually is national, um, but uh, we haven't finalized that one yet. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean that that whole concept of, of pairing the food and the wine, you know, is very much so. And then also this weekend, and I can't remember if it was in your session, I think it might have been. Um, though my memory isn't being in a different room, is uh, you know the the Italian word amaro, bitter, right? Right. Okay. Maybe isn't necessarily meant to denote a bitter wine, but a wine that's not sweet. Yeah. Because I had a, in the southern part of Italy, you had a lot of sweet wines. Sure. And so they created the, you know, not, they used the word Amaro to basically say this is not a sweet wine, not that it's a bitter wine. Right. Because some of those wines really aren't bitter. Right. No, not at you know? all. And I think a lot of times um, it's more the grape that has a bitterness to mm -hmm. it. Um, so that when you turn it into the wine, that bitterness can kind of subside a little bit. And, right. Um, you get more of that balance. Cool. Now, we haven't uh, talked about being a master. So... Uh, you obviously put a lot of time and effort into it. How long did it take to really kind of go into throughout the process? So I um, I was introduced to the Court of Master Sommeliers uh, shortly after I graduated college, and I was working in Dallas at uh, Glazer's. Okay. Um, great friend and mentor of mine, Guy Stout. Uh, awesome, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> at the time. Everybody in Texas loves Guy. Yeah, I mean. He was the first Master Sommelier in Texas, and he kind of introduced me to what the Court of Masters only has had to offer. I can remember uh, Drew Hendricks and myself sitting at his door every Monday morning, kind of knocking on his office door, and he's like, get away, kids. Like, <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't time for you to play. Uh, but finally, he allowed us into a study group, and um, I took my intro, 
um, intro exam, and then 11 years later, um, I was fortunate enough to pass my master's uh, to receive that accreditation. I earned that uh, in 2011. Okay. Uh, passed with a very, very dear friend of mine, Devin Broly. Yes. Uh, it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am today without him, and he would say the same thing. Like, in, in order to achieve that level, I truly believe that you need um, the support of your friends and family, and you need the support of somebody else that's kind of going through it to continue to push you and drive you and uh, help you to grow. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the, the Psalm movie uh, really touches upon the, not, you know, touches upon the whole fact that, you, that you're, you have to have that one, you have to have the support group like the, with the other wine, sure. other tasting, you know, the tasting your t- study group and all that. Um, but also with your your family, your your girlfriend, yeah. your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, whatever, you know, you have to have, they, they, they there's that support structure that, that uh, they, I guess, really need to have that understanding of what you're, you know, because you're, you're spending so much time of your life. I mean, it was a topic of discussion um, over the weekend you know, people saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not going to go any farther than this because I don't have time. I can't devote to it. Um, you know, I, I know personally, you know, I'm, I'm going to be sitting for my certified in a couple weeks. You know, and part of me is like, I'm, I'm, I think I'm ready. Part of me thinks I'm not ready. I hear all, hey, everybody has their, well, this is what I did. And this is how it happened. And this and that is what we need to know. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. Um, but, uh, you know, my plans are really not to necessarily go beyond that. Um, Really, just because I'm not in a, I'm not in a environment really that is as conducive to wine as, as say other people are. Sure. Uh, and that to me is as far as if you're going to go into the psalm field, whether it's in the distribution or the or the restaurant side, that uh, you have to have that environment more because to get beyond certified, you, you kind of have to live it on a more of a daily basis rather than on your day off. Yeah, it is. Know? It is. It was a full immersion. It is like you say, living it on a daily basis, and I. My wife is absolutely amazing to support me through that. Right. Um, I think Psalm is a awesome movie. I mean, April and I were talking to Jason last night, the director, and we both thanked him. Right. Because we now have an outlet when people say, "Well, I don't really understand what you do." We say, "Go watch, watch this movie. movie." Right. And it's a very accurate portrayal of the experience and the emotions and the highs and lows that you experience going right. through it. What I always tell individuals is that Psalm's wonderful. It only accounts for the three weeks leading up to the exam, not, <laughs> yeah, the, right. not the 11 years uh, of work that it took to get there, which are equally stressful. Yeah. You know, and, and, and even like, I can remember with the introduction, I mean, it, I, for, for me, the introductory exam wasn't difficult, um, but I also had spent probably four years of study on and <clears> off with books and all that. And, but I can remember um, right before we actually took the test, there was a lot of people with their note cards outside. And I just, and I me, mean, I was feeling a little cocky, but I was kind of looking, I was like, dude, if you don't know by now, you're not gonna know this. Right. I didn't say that to anybody, but it was just like in my head. I'm like, if you're frantically cramming with five minutes left, which I guarantee you I'm gonna be doing that in a couple <laughs> weeks, you know, I'm gonna lock myself in the, actually the rest of my day today is gonna be spent going through the virtual, uh, uh, virtual note cards on the iPad. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that the day before the test, I'm going to be at the hotel and we do the same thing. And, you know, I'll probably, well, I'll probably the day of, I'm probably not going to do anything because I'm like, well, what am I going to study, you know? But, um, but you know, it, it's a matter of, you know, I felt that for the intro, I was very prepared for it. I had also had just taken the CSW exam about two months prior. So that was a great, like, introduction. It was also back when, uh, and, and I'd gotten the study guide for that one. And when I took the intro, they hadn't sent the. They you only got the study guide the day of the the, the seminar. Oh wow! And for people to understand that the, the intro is not the, for the, okay. The certified specialist of wine is from the Society of Wine Educators, and then we have the court with the introductory sommelier, and the certified specialist of wine really is just wine. They're, they're, they don't talk about anything else. Uh, whereas the court, they're talking about spirits, beer, service, sure. even a little bit about cigars. Um, so there, it's more encompassing rather than just wine. But uh, for the intro, you have a two-day, a two-day seminar, um, but it's not there to teach you. It's really a review session. It's you know they they're, they're very clear on the site. You need to come in with the knowledge, not expect to learn everything. Yeah, there's a there's a base knowledge that I think you need to have going into the introductory exam. Um, right. But it is a pretty comprehensive day and a half of lecture 
uh, to where you, you receive a lot of the information that you're going to be tested yeah. on. And, and that's where my, my first introduction to a lot of the masters was, um, was, was this, because they're the ones really teaching the classes. Um, and and there, was, there, was some, there was advanced people teaching the classes too, right? Uh, it's right. only masters. It's only masters. Test, but the, advancers, the, the advancers are there to help assisting, out. assisting, right? Yes, yes. Because I think that's where I actually first remember seeing you and Devin. Sure. Um, was during that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was, it was wonderful. And then because of that and knowing that I was going to this conference, I was like, man, you know, I can only imagine what the conference is going to be like. Especially when I, you know, I knew what, what the sessions were going to be like. I was like, this is going to be awesome. That was also the year that uh, uh, I was not legally able to drink, <laughs> which is the reason I had a year hiatus with all this. So that that really hurt. It, it, it hurt you know the actual show is that I couldn't drink for a year. And I remember coming up to Guy. I had to have, you know had to get permission to leave the county. So I come up here and 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 uh, I, I before I walked in before everyone walked you know got into the room on the very first day I kind of walk in and. I didn't really know who Guy Stout was. I just, you know, he was the guy in the room, and he was in charge, or it seemed like he was in charge. Said, so, "Excuse me, but I, I, I didn't. I mean, I know we've got the tasting here, but I didn't realize it. But I'm, I'm not allowed. I'm like, I'm not allowed to drink, <laughs> you know. And 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 I mean, the the thing was, I was on I was on a probation for for a alcohol related event offense, sure. you know. And this part of probation, you can't drink. And I did, and I, I've known people that have been on these things, and they all—they're going to the bar, they're drinking at home. I'm like, you don't understand, man. I'm not messing with this. It's the law, right? I'm not messing. With, I'm not going to spend the weekend in jail because you know my my probation officer thinks that I, I did some drinking and I failed the test. So, but um, he was like, ah, don't worry about it. I'm like, all right, cool, you know. <laughs> and there, there was a tasting part, you know. They they they're, they're during the sessions. There's they're teaching us how to taste. Sure. And I can remember telling the guy next to me. That hey, when it comes to us, I'll do the smelling. I can do anything but taste, and I explained to him why. He was like, "Okay." So it came to us, and I was supposed to be the taster. I said, "We're going to swap," and uh, so we go through it, and um, I'm smelling it, and I'm, and you know, I did, I did what you're not supposed to do. I made the, I made, I made the decision. It was Chianti. Um, Dance down the Chianti train. Pretty much, yeah, and it was, it was a Chianti, and and so even though, but I listened to the tasting, what they were tasting. Um, so I was like, okay, I think I'm right on this. And then, then you know, they're, ask, they're asking us as a group to say what we think it is. And, and I, I gave them, I said, I think it's Classico for no other reason than I just pulled it really out of my butt. <laughs> it's Classico, you know? And we, we got it right. I mean, I think we were off maybe on the actual vintage, but our group got it right, you know? And uh, so that, that was kind of neat, though, how they, they go through that. So they, they go through the inductive tasting. Um, and then they show the they show kind of a mock service for us. Yeah. It's a uh, I, I really enjoy teaching the introductory classes and that the tasting that you're describing is one of my favorite parts of it. It's it kind of you can see the lights turn on yeah. in individuals as you start to explain how blind tasting is a deductive process. And once you explain that why we're looking at the color, what the nose of the wine is telling you, what mm -hmm. the palate, what the finish. Um, jumping into your initial and final conclusions and uh, teaching and explaining how to work through that, what we call the tasting grid. Right. And towards the end of day one, you really do, you see the lights kind of turn on. They're like, wow, I'm, I'm starting to get this. I've, yeah. been, I've been tasting and appreciating wine for years now, but now, now that I'm putting it in this deductive format, I, I really start to understand it. Yeah. And that's a really cool moment. And, I, and even though like that, that year that I... I that came up and I couldn't taste any of it. It really, it really had me focus on the nose. Yeah. Um, which, which you know, I, I've actually met, talked with people and, and heard you know through uh, pot through the Guild podcast that you know the the palate is where you really need to make your decision. Um, but and don't just sit there and focus on the nose because that's why I know a lot of people fall into that trap. Right. Uh, and, and Peter Neptune the other day was talking about. How he's telling his students to, to to taste it first and then smell it because he sees that everyone falls in a lot of people fall into the trap that I smell Sauvignon Blanc, so therefore I'm going to make sure everything I taste fits into the Sauvignon Blanc mold, sure. even though it's not Sauvignon Blanc. It's easy. It's easy in that situation. You have something in front of you that you don't know what it is, and you're trying to professionally analyze it to right. reach a final conclusion. It's easy to kind of dance down that Chianti path that yeah. you said and. Oh, I, this, there's a famil familiarity here that I can turn it into this almost. Right. Um, 
The other thing I'll say that is, I, I believe that everybody's palate is unique and different. Everybody's process is very unique and different. Um, I have a strong nose, a really good friend of mine that we've been working with him to get through the master's exam. He has a very strong palate. So in training him, um, one thing I did was I took away his palate. So he was only able to so analyze a wine by sight and by smell alone. Um, I should probably work on that because I'm not saying I have a strong palate, but I do have a weak nose. I have a weakness with whites. I have a weakness with floral, right? Just in general. So there's, I know, and that's I think I think when you're doing your tasting, I think it's good to know your weaknesses. Absolutely. Because that way, if you're struggling, maybe you kind of go, look, I'm not going to get it out of this. So let's let's go where I can really analyze. And I think once you understand that about your own your your own tasting. Once you understand that you're weak in florals, you can really start to smell a lot of flowers and a lot mm -hmm. of um, a lot of different perfumes to really enhance and build that portion for yourself. Right. It, it isn't tasting; isn't it is learned. It is something I I can't tell you how many hours I've spent in Whole Foods scratch <laughs> and sniff right everything, um, and I still do it to this day. Every two or three months, I'll go to Whole Foods and. Just spend two hours smelling things. There's so many different senses. It, it's actually overwhelming. My 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 nose and my palate and my my brain are tired after two right. hours of doing that. Yeah. Um, but it's it's all a catalog for me so that I can say, yeah, this is this is the difference between allspice and cardamom, and uh, this is the difference between a Meyer lemon and an a, a ordinary, regular, regular, regular lemon. lemon. Yeah, I've never had a Meyer lemon, so I, I'm gonna have to have a Meyer lemon because that seems to come up all the time. I smell Meyer lemon. I taste Meyer lemon. I'm like, you taste lemon. You know, it's. I remember my, for the for the intro, uh, uh, star fruit was like the it was like the joke. If you don't know anything, say it tastes like star fruit. I still get to have a star fruit, but because they say it was, nobody knows what it tastes like. <laughs> you know what I what the the analogy that I often draw is apples. We're all more yeah. familiar with apples and there's the big difference between that big granny smith green apple and a small um empire apple right um or a macintosh or whatever mm -hmm. it is and there's those are different flavors in those two apples there's a different flavor on a red versus a green apple right and once you start to understand that it can help you properly assess a wine we had a wine last night uh a white a white shot enough to pop which i've never had before so i was like yes please and uh, there was. Hi guys. How you doing? We were just talking about you, Mark. <laughs> uh, and it was. Uh, you look handsome. <laughs> and uh, there was this yellow apple component to it. And one of the guys was like, "I get cider." Like I, I was like, everyone at the table was like, "No, there's no cider in this." And then I started kind of thinking about. It. I was like, "No, I can understand where he's getting the cider from." Sure. Um, it, it was. It really. You know, I, and again, I'm building into that, so I'm thinking like, how can he come up with cider? And I start so smell and taste. And I'm like, well, I can get, I get it. You know, I've, I've, of some of the ciders I've had um, throughout the years, like it's apple-y, but there's this lightness to it. But sure. but it wasn't a, a it wasn't a beer, you know, a fermented apple thing out of it. But I could get that. But for him, it was probably really pronounced because maybe he loves cider and he likes, you know, he right. drinks it a lot. Whereas, you know, I, I have it every once in a great while. Maybe some people at the table almost never have it. But I was like, I get that. I, I get what he's talking about, but I wasn't going to go down the path of, oh, yeah, totally cider. Right. You know, so like I said, that, that's, that's where we all have our uniqueness and our palates and our backgrounds mm -hmm. and how we, how we taste and smell things. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Well, we've talked about – oh, so – in, in studying, so going through going through all the levels mm -hmm. with the court, um, was there anything, I mean, obviously the master is, is challenging, but was there anything that you felt that was really challenging or did it just get harder and harder? It, I think it's a, a progressively it gets more difficult and, um, yeah, it, tasting was one of the most difficult parts for me. Okay. Um, it was the, the part of the master's exam that, uh, took me the longest to pass. Um, theory was one of the easier sections for me. I, okay. And I think it was easy because I knew how my mind worked and I knew I knew what I needed to do in order to retain that information. Okay. Um, service was a bit of a challenge, um, but 
something I was able to overcome and tasting was really kind of that last hurdle. Right. So, and you've, you've really been more on the, on the distribution and, and retail side of things rather than really in the service part. Sure. So was that, was with the service side of things in, in the exams was, I mean, obviously in the, at the certified level you're doing service. So right. was, was that a, a bigger hurdle for you to kind of get that or, or do you feel comfortable um, going into yeah, that situation? Yeah, you know, I think, I think like anything, it just took a little extra preparation. Okay. Um, I ended up staging at a number of different restaurants kind of in my free time. Right. Um, so I would get off of my day job at about five or six and I would throw on a suit and I would go to a restaurant every other night to get some floor experience and actually understand what what a sommelier does. Right. Um, and I did that for about two or three years. So it was after that experience okay. that I was able to um, have confidence table. That's an awesome idea. I mean, I'm already in a restaurant situation, so. Sure. Um, but it, for individuals, there's a lot of there's a lot of individuals that are now on the retail side or are on the distributor side that are pursuing certain right. accreditations, and you really need to be on the floor to understand what a sommelier does. And right. uh, because I wasn't on a floor every day, I I would it's kind of what I did in my free time. Every other night, I would go to a restaurant and I would work the floor and right. kind of understand what had to be done. Yeah, uh, in my situation, since I'm more of a manager rather than than uh, a server. Um, my servers pretty much do all their wine presentations, but there will there will be times where the server is like, "Can you do the wine presentation?" I'm like, "Absolutely, yeah, I will." It's because a fun part. because yeah. one, it's fun. I haven't I have a good time doing it, um, uh, and 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 I think with the table, even though as a server you want to do everything for your table for your tip, um, there there's kind of a kind of this like specialness when the manager comes over and opens the bottle of wine for the table. Um, and uh, I, I did have an experience I've never had ever in opening however how many hundreds or thousands of bottles of wine now at this point is that I, the wine key I had wasn't exactly you know uh, top quality it was probably it was given to me it was um, because somebody had a bunch of them and it's just like anything that like your rep would give you um, but as I'm getting ready to um, uh, I'm still uh, screwing the worm in there that it broke off the handle broke off. Oh, wow. So I just had just had the, the worm just sitting in there. And I just kind of looked at my table and was like, I'll get you another bottle. <laughs> and I literally said, I've never seen that happen yeah. where, where where my corkscrew I've I've seen corkscrews bend. I've seen like, you know, it, it over time that the metal the metal gets gets fatigued and it, and it bends, but I've never seen like the handle come off. It was a plastic handle. And um, it actually caused me to purchase a, a better wine key for myself. Sure. So that when I do take my certified, I don't have that situation because I have the same wine key at home that I had at work, and I was like, I am not gonna have right. this happen in front of them. But um, you know, that's that's something that you know people have talked to me about with with the service end of things that you you know you are gonna be tested on how how cool you can be. It's not just a, and I've told people it's not just they don't want to see how I open a bottle of wine. That's the easy part. It's everything else yeah, that's, that's it, involved. It's, it's, it's all encompassing, and you know the advice that I give individuals is that when you're in that service room, it is very stressful. You're serving yeah. master sommeliers, um, but it, it's a matter of being approachable. It's a matter of salesmanship. The, at that at that point, at that level, the mechanics of opening a bottle of wine, of setting the stemware, of pouring, that should be second nature. That right. should be something that you're not thinking about. Um, what 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 you should be thinking about is, am I likable? Is this is this a server that I want standing table side, or is right. this somebody that I'm like, oh, don't I don't want you coming around anymore? <laughs> right. Yeah, and and you know when I try to explain the test to people, um, you know they, and, and even at my level, you know it's like. They, they don't quite understand it, then they'll ask me, do you think you're gonna pass this? Well, I think I'm pretty good on this, this. You know, and, and the, actually even for me, I really think the service side of things is, is gonna be probably the one I'm gonna be the most, most concerned about. It may not be the one that's gonna be the most difficult, but it's one I'm actually the most concerned because I don't uh, do the wine service at work as right. much as I probably should. Um, but we also don't sell a lot of bottles of wine, so I don't see every bottle of wine that goes out. Um, and uh, especially if I'm working in the back, I, I'll never see the bottles that go out. Right. So it's, uh, you know, it's a matter of 
you know, just having that cool, calm, collected feeling. And, you know, and, and I know that when I'm in the restaurant situation, if I have an issue, just a, maybe it's not a wine issue, but just an issue in general, is how you handle it yeah, with absolutely. your guest is, is really going to, is really going to uh, make or break whether you've caught the entire meal or you can get them a free dessert and they'll be happy. Services, you know? I, I believe that service is about that guest experience above all else. Yeah. It's about making your guests comfortable in every situation. Um, and the best sommeliers are the individuals that can do that very gracefully. Right. Yeah, it's totally about you know figuring out you know, I mean, there, there, are, there are some situations that there, there is no hope. Um, it, it hopefully, it doesn't ever happen, but it, there, there's been it just everything in the world has gone wrong, and there's nothing you can do uh, to really make them happy. Even, even if you bought the entire meal, they're still unhappy because they had a bad experience. It was their anniversary or something. Sure. Ruined, you know, um, but then there'll be times when, you know, they, they initially they're, they're very upset about something, and you're, you're handling it, you're not avoiding them. You're, you're doing everything you can and they start seeing that and they see that you're genuinely doing it. You're not just just to please them. You're, you're, you have a concern that you want them to leave happy. Yeah. Um, you know, I do take it personally when, when things go wrong at work, you know, because uh, it's, it's very difficult. And, and, and luckily where I work, um, we, we tend to have a higher standard than other places I worked at. So that actually means that we tend to execute really well. I don't have a lot of issues, whereas other places I've worked that were not, not, as, not as a higher level, um, a lot of my table visits were, you know, things aren't really good, okay? Um, not, it was not bad. I mean, I don't wanna say it was horrible, but there'd be days where every visit was bad, and it was more often than not where I work now. Most of my visits are, everything's wonderful, your staff's wonderful, the food is wonderful, yeah. thank you for stopping by, you know, and. And so it's a much easier situation. Yeah, but when you when you have the bad situations, it's it, it, how you handle it um, is very paramount. And I yeah. know that probably as much as anyone else in my particular restaurant, because when bad things happen and people send in their surveys or their emails, I get to call them. And even if whether I was the one who handled it initially or I wasn't the person on the floor that day, you know, now I get to try to still win them back, which sure. is more difficult once they've left your store. Yeah. Once they leave, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to get them to feel good, but. I train my staff to do, I call it the three A's. It's acknowledge, hmm. it's act, and apologize. Right. And if I feel like when you do approach those uh, challenging service situations, the guest wants to be acknowledged. Absolutely. They, you need to act on it, and then you need to apologize. Those right. are, and a lot of times, if, if, if my servers will just go through those three pretty basic steps, and I find that the guests typically leave pretty satisfied. Yeah, they, they will. And, and really, there's also, a, there needs to be a genuineness to it. It's, it can't be a mechanical thing. Sure. It can't be like... Sincerity um, is yeah, a big deal. You have to. And, and, and like I said, I do actually take it personally, so it's not a fake sincerity. I might... I might not be happy with the situation that's going on, whether it's my fault actually or somebody on my staff made the mistake. It still falls on me no matter what. Sure. That I have to, you know, then, then it becomes a learning situation with your staff uh, to say, how can we prevent that again, you know? Yeah. But sometimes stuff happens. <laughs> Some things are out of your control. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, uh, I think we've had an awesome talk. I mean, we kind of went down some paths I didn't even think we were going to go down, <laughs> which tends to happen with, with, with the interviews. We, I just try to have a conversation rather than just sure. a straight, well, these are my questions, um, because I find that those, those types of interviews are boring. Sure. Um, and I'd rather hear stories and, and hear that. Do um, you have anything you want to you chat about? And Because you know, I know we've been going for almost an hour now. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. We've covered a lot of, a lot of ground. Oh, I, I really appreciate you coming in. Uh, I also want to really thank uh, Four Seasons. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, James and Drew. I want to thank Drew, especially Drew, because he's the person that really got us so we could record in this room. Yeah. Okay. Um, up until a few days ago, it was like we were going to have to like find a place off property, but Drew was like, we got you. So, which is good. I mean, the PR, uh, I know that we have to go through the PR people, and uh, they were awesome at least. You know, they, they got the ball rolling for me, um, especially when James and Drew are busy. You know, I know they have to 
they have to have people take care of stuff. So they were they were great. Um, I think Keely, I can't remember Keely's last name um, off the top of my head, but uh, you know she was great with communicating with me and giving me a list of people that might be uh, good interview, you know, good people to interview. Um, and then just want to thank you know James and Drew uh, and yeah, Tech what, Som. They, what what James and Drew have done for Tech Som. Speaking, Speaking of, knowledge, they're right there. <laughs> they have, just walked by. What they have done for the <laughs> Texas industry um, yeah. through Tech Som is absolutely amazing. Yeah. So awesome. I thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mark. I will definitely try to get to Austin soon. Yeah, to come go visit. Check out We'd the love places. to see you. Yeah. And uh, folks, that's going to that's going to do it for now. Um, as always, I want to thank you for stopping by. Uh, click the links above. No, so I click links above right here. Hit the donate button over there, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time. Cheers. Cheers, absolutely. Cheers.